And I just wanted to thank everyone for coming so much for today. Uh, I'm also really excited to be uh, introducing uh, our presenter, Clint Carlson, who took the time out to be here today. And this is a workshop. So we're going to have a little bit of an introduction. And uh, after that, Clint is going to show us what he's done with Coast Bases and what he knows about it. And if you are joining on a cell phone, um, which I don't think anyone is, but if you are, you might want to grab a laptop. Um, otherwise, be ready because we're going to have a hands-on portion, which I'm really excited about. So we can actually go in and explore it a little more. So one of the things that I wanted to start off with is, again, big thank you to Clint for taking the time out today to be here to present. Uh, Clint comes to us uh, from uh, he's a program manager of digital education and academic technology, School of Medicine, University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus, and uh, kind of a newer member of the Colorado community. So not too new, maybe summertime. So we're excited that you're, you're here in the university systems. And Clint is also incredibly passionate about adopting augmented reality and virtual reality tools. And uh, once you hear him talk. I know he is also great at both technology and teaching and learning. Um, besides that, we connected looking at virtual reality um, to see how we at Alltech could be promoting it, enhancing immersive technology here. Uh, this seems to be taking off and Clint has a background of working in international education and also working with English language acquisition learners in the international school in Istanbul. So another really nice connection there. And I put his email and I'll be sharing this presentation with you later and can also send any additional links and Clint, if you wanna include anything. Yeah, uh, I'll share my presentation as well, so. Great, yeah, perfect. Um, again, we're looking at extended reality and XR is kind of this umbrella term for virtual reality and augmented reality. And this type of technology extends the reality that we're experiencing by blending virtual and real life, or it can be fully immersed in a digital environment. And this looks a little crazy uh, when I think about it. Uh, however, I've been using Pokemon Go for about two years. So while this might seem very futuristic, um, you know, and my son is like, yeah, you know, I've been using this. I think it's popping up in K through 12 all over the place. So um, it's something that's that's really up and coming, um, but also here. And so again, when you look at extended reality for language learning, um, this is a way that doesn't necessarily replace the traditional ways that we teach in classroom, but it gives an, a, an, an extended way for learners to connect with culture and language in addition, we have a lot of digital natives and I, I mentioned my son in K through 12, oftentimes they're coming into it and this is a space that they're comfortable with and you might not have the same type of pressure when you're practicing a language and you're able to look at a you know, judgment-free digital space. So I put some quotes on here and the reason why I'm looking at this now and the reason why Alltech is looking at this now is there is some research coming out with language learning and virtual reality. And this is kind of a place where we want to participate in. And uh, this particular presentation will be focusing on student engagement. Um, and when you look at Bloom's taxonomy of learning, students can create and co-spaces. So this tool has that virtual reality, augmented reality possibility and is student-centric and fun and has a way for students to share what they're learning in the language. So let me go back here. We've got for CoSpaces, it's a platform that offers a unique way to teach with immersive technology. You can really do anything and Clint will talk more about this, but just a little taste is you can do fully immersive virtual tours, storytelling, exhibitions, games, simulations, and a lot more. Um, we also are going to be looking at virtual reality apps coming up. So if this is something that's interested in you and you haven't signed up for the next workshop, I'll be sending out information on that. 
and also a survey because I want to know what you thought about this. And finally, um, if you are interested in extended reality um, and wanting to connect with all tech, uh, we would like to work with you. We are interested in looking at faculty that want, if this is your tool and you want a pro account or you have a project or idea, this is something all tech could sponsor. And we will be starting in spring 2021, an immersive technology working group. So if you are also interested in learning more, wanting to add some virtual reality into your class or immersive technology or projects, please let us know. We'll reach out and we'll loop you in for a once a month, kind of let's figure it out together and some next steps at the university. And so finally, we hope that we motivate you with some of these tools to become the next expert. We're not necessarily the experts, but we would like to empower you as faculty to become the experts and to utilize some of this technology in your language classrooms. So, all right, Clint, thank you for allowing me to jump in. Wow, what a monster introduction. Thank you so much uh, for that and for this at large, you know, um, this is a, a great opportunity for us to be able to, to talk about things and to understand a new tool and to really kind of get in on the ground floor of uh, the type of technology that is uh, really going to be everywhere and in a matter of a couple of years. Uh, but there's no reason to, to not start right now. Um, yeah, so thanks again. Uh, my name's Clint. Um, as Karen said, I did just move to Denver in July. I was in Istanbul for three years and in India for four years prior to that. So uh, mid-pandemic, moving back to the United States to a new city, to a new state, to a new position uh, in higher education, uh, everything's new. Uh, but we're doing great, <laughs> I love it in here. All right, so let me share my presentation and this will make a little bit more sense how we're structuring this today. All right, uh, thumbs up, see my presentation? Great, I'm not gonna make it full screen because I'm gonna be hopping between this and co-spaces and a couple of other things. Uh, so uh, we're a small enough group where if a question comes up, feel free to unmute yourself and just jump right in. Uh, we can keep this pretty organic. So this is gonna be in two parts. So one is really talking about the power and potential of uh, creating simulated environments, which is really uh, what XR is. So we're talking about extended reality, we're talking about virtual reality, augmented reality. It's all about simulating environments and simulating experiences and simulating conversations and interactions. Uh, then we're gonna move into part two, which is the workshop where we're going to be actually creating a virtual reality world together today. Uh, and you'll see just how quick and easy it is to jump in and start building things out. Uh, our project today is we're going to create a, we're each going to create a parade celebrating University of Colorado. So you'll, you'll see that in 20 minutes when we, when we hop right into it. Uh, I'm not going to read these slides to you, but these are the learning objectives that I structured of, this is what you should be getting out of this, this workshop webinar that we're doing together. So you'll have a full understanding of what AR, VR, and uh, XR mean what that, those are. Uh, you'll be brainstorming ideas on how to use this technology in your classroom and with your students as we go along. Um, if we've got time towards the end, I'd love to hear any ideas that have popped into your head while we've gone through this process together. Uh, we'll be look, also thinking about how your students can use this type of technology not only to create locally, uh, but because it's virtually, we could be creating projects that work with other students from all around the world. Uh, super powerful, especially for uh, language learners and language classes. To be able to take a project like this and collaborate with a student whose um, native tongue is the language you're trying to collaborate with, that can be really, really powerful. Uh, maybe most importantly is that you'll see some low barrier ideas on how to bring AR, VR into your classroom. Uh, this says as early as Monday, but it really means as early as tomorrow. Uh, and you will have created your own virtual reality, augmented reality simulation all of that in the next uh, 49 minutes. So let's jump in. Uh, so here's part one. We're gonna talk about the power potential and access of being able to do these things. Uh, so why VR, AR? Well, from a big picture standpoint, some things are very, very expensive to do in real life with your students, or they're too large, or they're too dangerous. And to talk about the physics of a car crash is really, really difficult to do in a classroom when you cannot do a car crash. But if you could simulate a car crash over and over and over in the same way and analyze it from a bunch of different angles, you can start having a, maybe a deeper conversation of, of how can we prevent car crashes or make things more safe. 
And some things are just too far away and by far too expensive. So this is the Mars Rover. So for us to be able to do things and simulate things on other planets uh, is, is really a huge jump from creating the solar system with styrofoam balls in your classroom. I mean, to be able to jump into Mars and simulate what the gravity is like in a virtual environment uh, is something you can do in just a couple of minutes with the, with the right tools and the right knowledge and the right workflows on how to do stuff. And in particular, uh, right now, it's, it's difficult to collaborate with each other. Uh, for students to be able to work in small groups and be able to do things, yeah, we're finding ways of doing that remotely with Zoom and things like this, but it's difficult to create stuff in a collaborative environment. And creating stuff in a virtual simulation uh, really allows that. Uh, so this is a, a new slide to this deck, uh, now that things have, have changed in our world. Uh, so a couple of things that I've been doing in the past uh, using the CoSpaces application that we're talking about here today. And this should play. And let's see if I can make it larger. So this using CoSpaces, let me brief it before I try to talk over it. So we wanted to create, at my last position, we wanted to create an art gallery in our school. And we wanted to do it using virtual reality. And we wanted the same hallway to show a different experience every time somebody walked through it. So what we did was that we took little tracking codes, which will make a little more sense when we get into the workshop. Uh, tracking code is what your simulation attaches to. So that could be just a sheet of paper on your desktop or something up on the wall. So we put this up on the wall and students using CoSpaces created different museums of technology. So this was about medical technology. So as we walk through this hallway and just looking through our iPad, we're seeing these uh, different milestones of technology happening. So this one was a technology of medicine. So as we walked up and let me see that one more time, uh, walking down the hallway and as we turn our iPad towards that piece of paper on the wall, we get this virtual or this augmented reality experience. So this was the beginning of uh, medicine technology. And as the student moves down the hallway into the next one, uh, we move through time and we're able to see these different milestones of medical technology happening. Uh, then we were able to go back and load up a new simulation that another student made and walk through that same hallway and experience eight milestones of computer technology or of driving technology. Uh, not only did that allow us to create a massive uh, augmented reality gallery in just one hallway, uh, but we were able to share these experiences with other students all around the world. So we were doing this in a hallway in Istanbul, uh, but very, very quickly and easily, uh, we were able to share this and there was another hallway of another international school in Moscow and they were walking down the hallway experiencing the same timelines that our students had created. And then they were sharing their experiences back. So it allowed us to kind of see what students were creating, but in a real world environment. I mean, this is kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about XR. Uh, another example. So we did a virtual plate project, which I uh, partnered with CoSpaces on because I had this idea for this VR plate project and CoSpaces is always hungry for new things to provide to people that are using CoSpaces. So what we did was we used, again, augmented reality, uh, again, using the same CoSpaces tool that we're gonna be doing in a few minutes. Uh, we had all of our students recreate the last plate of food that they had eaten. And yes, that is a pterodactyl over on the left because sometimes these things do get a little silly also. Uh, but it allowed us to not only recreate our last meal, but to share the last meal that we had with students all around the world. And then we were able to have conversations about, well, where did this food come from? And why is breakfast in Istanbul different than breakfast in Tokyo? Why would that be? And then we start having a deeper conversation about well, where does my food come from and what culturally leads my breakfast to be so different than a breakfast in Mexico City. Uh, so this was really great. And if I had the volume up and if you were really viewing this the way it was intended, you would hear a student voiceover speaking over it, explaining these are the types of ingredients that are in this meal. And my, uh, my, my father made me this uh, dinner for me last night and the ingredients came from the market down the street. And what was really interesting is again, we partnered this up with the school in Moscow and the students in Moscow were real quickly realizing by doing a little bit of research into their plate of food that a lot of their fresh produce was actually coming from Turkey. So that was a fun little connection that we had with the students where they were seeing that, oh yeah, this is a smaller world than sometimes feels. 
Uh, but this allowed us to share these plates of food. And then this became a very large project where if you go to the right page in CoSpaces, you'll see hundreds of plates of food from all around the world as students participated with this um, all over the place. That was really fantastic. Uh, here's that lesson plan. So this was the piece that I grew, uh, put up. And when I share this presentation with you, you can go to this link and you can see the lesson plan on all the plates of food that are sitting there waiting for your students to jump in and explore and understand. And really that's just a CoSpace app on their phone. And they can just hold the phone and they tilt it down at the table in front of them. And that plate of food appears from all around the world with an explanation of where that food came from. Uh, here's another incredible project that we did in CoSpaces. Uh, Volume's up. So we had a project for our seventh graders. It was a combination of our maths courses, science, and humanities. And it was a hypothetical situation where climate change had gotten so severe that we've got 50,000 climate change refugees who have relocated to a small island in, in the Pacific Ocean. But then the students are figuring out, well, what kind of government are we going to have? And how are we going to build infrastructure? And what kind of tax system do we want to have? Like, how do we create a city in the sea. Uh, they had been doing this for a couple of years before I got involved. And then I threw in the idea, well, what if instead of just creating that city in the sea out of pieces of cardboard, because it was really a lot of cardboard tubes, what if we created this in virtual reality? So each of these students sort of divided their city up into a small section of it and 3D modeled and through co-spaces created a virtual simulation of what that city would look like. Uh, really, really powerful and allowed students to put on the, the cardboard with their phone inside of it and walk down the streets of the city that they had created. And then that opened up all kinds of conversations because all of a sudden you're realizing that your neighbor put their sanitation part of their city right on the edge where your residents are sitting. So then they needed to have a conversation of, well, how do we govern a city that makes things uh, equal and fair for everybody? Uh, which part of the city is going to have the humongous airport so that we don't all have to have an airport? I mean, it really opened the conversation up in, in ways that it wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, we've also used a lot of co-spaces uh, with virtual and augmented reality to pre-prototype things that we would 3D print. Uh, so 3D printing is traditionally for prototyping. So you would 3D print something, make sure that it works the way you want it to, and then you go have it mass produced somewhere. Uh, but often that 3D prints can take a couple of hours and especially with students, uh, they don't wanna do that multiple times as they make revisions of things. Well, we can take that 3D model, put it into co-spaces and view what that model would look like in real life before we did the 3D print. So that's the 3D model and then attaching it to that cube and we can see that's the 3D model outside. They're rotating around, viewing it from every angle before we took it off and did the actual 3D print uh, this was a, a Pearl Jam Christmas ornament for one of their <laughs> teachers who was a huge Pearl Jam fan. So we built that together. Uh, here's another project. Uh, boy, this one is fascinating. Let me make this a little bit larger. So this student used CoSpaces to, uh, how do I be concise about this? The project was to create a project that addressed um, a real world problem. And eventually that got into the sustainable development goals established by the United Nations, but we started locally, what kind of problems could we solve uh, in our school? And then how can we represent that to sort of pitch that idea using virtual reality as a way of presenting our idea? So this student had what I'm convinced is a billion dollar idea that he needs to get a patent on and start saving millions of people's lives. Because the idea was that instead of having a map on the wall of every classroom telling you this is the closest, this is your fire path to get out. There's a fire in this building and go out the door, take a right, go down the stairs, take a left and go out the door. What that doesn't account for is what if the fire is between you and your closest exit? So this student's concept was I'm going to put a small LED screen in every room and that will have a map on it. And when a fire alarm is pulled, it will dynamically direct students to the closest exit that gets them away from the fire or disaster in the building. And then to better understand how that would work, it was then created in co-spaces. You can see this three-dimensional environment uh, where instead of going directly down those stairs and into the fire, this uh, prototype would send the, the people in a different direction to get them out of the building quickly and most importantly, safely in a way that couldn't have been done before. 
So a rather interesting way of using co-spaces to communicate ideas that don't have anything to do with virtual reality. Uh, here's another great one. Uh, this is uh, where that idea for the uh, timeline of medical history came from. So this again, just putting these pieces of paper up on the wall and it would load these art gallery pieces. So this opened up a big conversation with our art teachers, uh, both at our school and in our region, discussing, well, what does it mean when people can walk into your art gallery and they can curate it for themselves? Or if they can take pieces of art and they can curate it for themselves at home and share it with other people. Uh, it really started getting people thinking about, yeah, the whole paradigm of art creation is uh, massively going to be disrupted by something like this. Uh, fairly interesting because then we also had students able to communicate their process on why did they curate it the way they did? Why are we seeing things in this order instead of the order that the curator of the museum put together? And it really gave that conversation a lot of depth. Sort of a, a mini montage of a couple of other projects. Integrating, turn that volume down. We 3D modeled our entire school. And once we did that, we were able to do incredible things like raise the sea level and see what would happen to the school if the sea level raised by two feet. And as it turned out, uh, this was my office down here. And the place where we happened to have been working on this was the first place to be completely buried in water. Uh, so that was uh, super interesting to be able to, to simulate sort of natural disasters. Uh, here's a high resolution vision of that city in the sea. Students were recreating um, structures around the world and then placing them in that world. So using co-spaces, you can see right there, uh, this was a second grader who 3D modeled this Eiffel Tower. And then we put it in a 360 degree VR space inside of co-spaces to see, well, what would that model actually look like in the space where it's intended to be? And then she was able to continue to refine that. Uh, we had some fourth and fifth graders, they redesigned their playground. So they uh, were given the task to put together a plan for what they want the playground to be when they came back in the fall. So these students, uh, again, we were just using co-spaces. They redesigned their playground each individually and they did all kinds of things we didn't expect. We thought it would all be slides and swings, uh, but a lot of them put in a butterfly garden. A lot of them put in a stream of water going through. A lot of them wanted to be more of a, a primitive outdoor space for them to explore. And then they were able to take these into the school board meeting and just hold up iPads and show the school board who was going to be paying for all of this exactly what their vision was. And we were able to here just overlay it on top of the existing playground and start getting an idea of what this, is, this would look like. Yeah, we'll jump over that. So <clears throat> before we start building stuff, um, your main question is, well, what about all of my standards? How does this attach to my curriculum? Uh, you're in great luck because this is already tied into many of the uh, advanced standards around digital technology. So if you're familiar with ISTE, which is the International Society of Technology Education, uh, they're fantastic. And they've got a whole list of different uh, standards and criteria to make sure that your students are getting to where they need to be from an educational standpoint. And VR and AR uh, ties into this really, really nicely. Uh, so some of their standards are being able to maintain and manage a variety of digital tools, digital communication and collaboration tools to communicate locally and globally with students. Uh, that can be really difficult to do without the, the right tool. Uh, but this does this right out of the box. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, being global collaborators, um, let's skip over our roadmap for right now. Uh, but let's, because I want us to start building. <laughs> and then we'll branch off and start talking about things. So uh, before I do that, uh, any questions about any of the things that you've seen so far? Great. So our next piece is we're going to build something in CoSpaces so we can start unlocking the potential to do all kinds of projects, just like the ones you've seen and all kinds of things that I haven't even thought of, that, that you will come up with, that your students will come up with. Uh, and that will be fantastic. So our first step is to go to cospaces.io. Uh, make sure you go to the IO. If you don't go to the IO, you'll end up on a different site. So open up a new tab or on another device or wherever you want to be. We're going to go to cospaces.io. And in the upper right corner, there is a register button. And when you click that register button, it will ask you, are you a student or are you a teacher? 
And in this case, you're going to be a student and it's going to ask you for your classroom code because I've already created a co-space uh, with a space for all of you to be working. So when you put that code in, it will inject you into my classroom and then I can facilitate from there. Uh, it will ask you to then create an account. Uh, we're asking that you use your personal account right now. Uh, the reason that we're doing that is because when you do want to take the step and do this for real, for real with your Colorado University account, uh, you're going to want to be that teacher account. So you can do what I'm doing to facilitate this. And there is a, a way to migrate that from student to teacher. I mean, that is a way to do it. But for now, I think it's just the easier path for you to make sure you're using your personal account uh, to be the student in this. And uh, I'll put that code in the chat because I'm going to switch screens. And I'm going to switch to my co-spaces. Here we go. Everybody see this winter wonderland? Yes? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to hop back to my home. I'm going to go to my classes. And here's the class that I created for everybody. So you can kind of see behind the scenes of what the, the teacher sees. And as you, so I can already see that five of you have put in the code and have joined my class. As soon as you do, it initiates a copy of the co space that I applied to you. And for everyone here, I created a road with a couple of houses because this is where we're going to be creating our uh, winter parade. Uh, so we'll give it a couple of minutes and see if we can get everybody joined in. Uh, I know that some of us uh, might not be able to be fully engaged into it. They just might not have the right device or uh, you're multitasking. Uh, so we'll give it a couple of minutes and see if uh, anybody else can jump in. Uh, and then we're going to jump in and start learning the ropes of co-spaces. Uh, we won't cover it all, but we will. It's uh, there's so much potential <laughs> locked inside of it, it'll blow you away. Uh, but we will cover quite a bit of it. All right, we've got six out of six out of 10 minus me. That's pretty good. All right, we'll 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 move ahead. Uh, if you're still getting caught up or booting up a machine or something, I put in the classroom code in the chat so you can uh, join in anytime or just watch and follow along. All right, so I'm going to hop out of my classes because I just want to be in the same space you are. So everyone should have been able to click on their assignment and see something similar. Uh, anybody having a problem so far? Yes, cospaces.io. All right, let me bring my notes over here. All right, so before we begin, I just want you to do a little brainstorming yourself uh, inside. Start thinking about what your parade is going to look like. So start with thinking about two characters. So two people that are going to be in this parade and think about uh, what age do you think they're going to be? What gender are they going to be? Are they going to be happy, angry, sad? Just sort of think of the characteristics of the people in there. And also start thinking about what kind of dialogue might they be having? They might be saying, hooray, Colorado University. They might be saying, what a great day for a parade. Uh, they might be saying, they could be saying anything. It is entirely up to you. Uh, then start thinking about two objects. So maybe maybe like a balloon that one character could hold. Uh, just think of things that might be engaged in the parade. Maybe that's a, a box of popcorn. Uh, completely open-ended because you're gonna be able to do anything that you wanna do inside of co-spaces when we hop in. Uh, so if it's, if it's open-ended, it's supposed to be. Uh, that could be a hat on one of the character's heads. It could be, you know, I mean, really anything. Uh, and then think about two animals. So one animal that one of these characters would ride and another uh, animal that would just be navigating in the parade. And that could be an animal that flies, it could be an animal that swims, it could be an animal that walks around and trots. Uh, and then we're gonna start building this out. So let me, here's my co-spaces. So let's talk about the interface a little bit because everybody should be seeing exactly what I've got shared up on the screen. Uh, we've got our home tab up here. Uh, that always takes us back to our regular code spaces where we can jump into other projects. Um, but what is important for you to see is this play button over here all the way on the far right upper corner. Anytime you click that, it'll bring you into play mode, which is sort of a simulation of what this is going to be like in VR. So I hit that play button and it sort of made it full screen. And I can click my mouse and drag around and see that I'm in a 360 degree world. I could use the arrow keys on my keyboard and walk around and move through this 3D space. 
And that's essentially all I can do in preview mode because it's really just giving you a quick little snapshot of, all right, is the thing that I built in VR, is it working the way that I would? So you're gonna be toggling back and forth between the play button and this back button in the upper left uh, pretty often. I'm gonna hop back here. Uh, next to play is a code button, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, we're gonna lay down some foundational stuff first. Uh, importantly, down in the bottom left, we see another little tab. There's a library, an upload, and an environment. So if you want, uh, you can go into an environment and click that edit and change your environment to something else. Um, you could certainly do one with these huge buildings. Uh, that's, that's a great one. Uh, there's uh, some silly ones. We could, we could put this on the moon. You could see earth in the background. Uh, it could be inside of a house. Probably not great for a parade, but that is a uh, potential. And I'm gonna put us back in the, let me do this one. So here's my, my town in the middle of uh, nowhere <laughs> in the snow. And that gives me just a, a nice empty place to be able to build things. Now, while you're doing this, I as teacher facilitator can go back into my classes and I can look at any of your projects and see where you are so far. So I'm able at any time, and if Karen were to change her environment, I'll see that change in real time on my side as the facilitator. So I can do all of this remotely. I can just hop in and out of uh, different students' work and see what they're working on. I can jump in. I can make changes to things for them. Uh, if I need to show something for an example, yeah, yeah, I see what you're trying to do there, but here's an easier way. So let me jump back into mine. And let's start creating. So I'm going to go down to my library and think about those two characters that you were first thinking about. And we're going to look for one that's very similar to that in this library. And mine, I'm going to start with uh, this girl in the blue skirt. And all I need to do is click and drag her into the scene. And there she is. She's sitting there. If I use my scroll wheel on my mouse, I can start zooming in so I can find detail. And if I click and drag, I can rotate the space around. So I'm going to bring this girl in a little bit. And if I just click, I get four options. So my bottom right option is scale. So all I need to do is click and drag up or down, and I can make this character big or small. I'm gonna make her a giant in this parade. Uh, next to that is the lift button. So if I just click and drag her around, she's sort of flat on that X, Y plane. But if I wanted her to be up in the sky, which we would do if I brought in an animal that's going to fly, I can click this and drag her up and she's up in the air. Uh, we've got undo and redo next to our home button in the upper left. So we can undo any of that if I make a mistake or I experimented and I don't want it. But back to just single clicking her, I've got my scale, I can raise her up. I've got a rotation tool. So if I click rotation, I get these three colors and that allows me to rotate in all three directions. So I can start building this scene and putting this character in here, making her whatever size I want, positioning her wherever I want her to. I can rotate her so she's looking in a direction that I would like. Uh, if I don't like just clicking and dragging her around, I can also choose my top right, which gives me little arrows. So I can click, so I can click these arrows and drag her around. Kind of lets me be a little more precise about where these characters are going to be. So I've got my one character in here. I'm gonna bring in, Oh, she rotated around. I'm going to bring in another character. So if I, I'm in my characters still, if I go all the way to the far end, I start getting some silly stuff. Like I'll get a Grinch, I'll get a pirate. I'm going to bring this pirate in. Make him a little bit larger. And now I've got two characters in here. Uh, that's a great start, but um, let's do a little bit more. So I can, if I single click again, I get all of these four options. But if I Double click. Now I've got some powerful tools and we're gonna get into most of them. Uh, but starting off first, I'm gonna go to my material, which is here in my bottom right. And I can change her hair color. I could change her skirt color or shirt color. I can change her skin tone. I can change her skirt. So I've got a lot of control to make these characters uh, look exactly how I want them to look. 
whether that's something that I'm imagining or if I'm trying to recreate a scene from a movie or a play, uh, there's a lot of power in here. So that was materials. Um, I can also set that opacity down to, I can make her invisible. Uh, this is one of the things that my students discovered that I hadn't thought of was that they decided to make a haunted house. So they wanted these ghosts to be semi-transparent so they could be kind of spooky. Uh, that was an interesting thing. <laughs> so back in the material, I'm gonna set that back to 100%. So she's there. Um, next step, so again, I'm double clicking for that advanced menu. Um, next thing I want us to look at is the animation because this is where students tend to have a lot of fun. So in this animation, I can choose a variety of reactions. I can choose postures. I could choose actions. So I could have her pretending to point at something. I can have her reacting to something, clapping. And again, if I hit that play button, I could see her clapping. She's there doing it. Clint, where did you go again? Sorry, I yep. got my characters. How do you get them to do reactions again? To do the reactions. So if I single click, I can sort of position my character. But if I double click, I get an option called animation. And here you can have them happy, sad, cheering, uh, any of those reactions that you might have been brainstorming when you're thinking your two, two characters. So I'm going to have my, and you'll, you'll notice that different characters have different options. So if I go into my pirate and his animations, uh, I get a little more of a limited thing, but I can use the spyglass, I can use the spyglass incorrectly, it's all pirate stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna do a spyglass scan and we can see that pirate is scanning their horizon while our fancy girl is cheering for him. Uh, that's a great start. So what else can we do? If we double click this again, uh, let's go into speech. And I can put in a speech bubble or a thinking bubble. So I could have it say, this is really great. And when I click out of this, she's got that uh, speech bubble ready to go. I'm going to do the same thing with my pirate. I'm going to choose speech, but I'm going to do think. Hmm. And you'll see that the bubble's different. It's more thinking rather than saying. So that's a way that we can start with dialogue. Uh, it's not as far as we can go because we can absolutely record audio and include that in here too, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, let me check my agenda, animation, dialogue, reactions. Great. So that's a good start. Everybody cruising? Let's take a look at what everyone's up to. Excellent. So we've got one character over here thinking, ha ha. And I can jump into anybody's projects and see how they're, how they're doing. All right, back to my space. Okay, uh, so that's great. But a parade is not just standing around saying, hmm, and talking about things. It's actually moving down the parade route. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click my pirate and just hit my delete key and I can delete things. If that was a mistake, I can undo it. But I'm going to take this character and let's turn off that dialog box. And I'm just going to drag her down to this side and she's going to walk down the walk down the road. She's in a parade. Let's make her a little bit larger so everybody can see. And so first thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to double click and find an animation for walking down the street. So if I go into actions, I can have her dancing, running, talking excited, uh, waving is pretty great for a parade. That might be nice. So let's do a quick little preview. There she is waving. So our next step is, and this is what uh, can be really great for some students, is that this can be an introduction to uh, programming and coding. And we're gonna do that with just like two lines of code. So don't be intimidated, it's, it's very, very basic. Again, if I double click on my character and I click on the code button, what I wanna do is use in code blocks, I wanna turn that on. And this allows me to be able to program uh, with our character. Uh, our character's name is Fancy Girl. That's just the default by Cospaces. Uh, we'll just change that to we'll change that to Parade Girl. And so now she's been activated. We can use her in Coblox, which is the programming language of Cospaces. And I promise this is not too bad. If we click on that code button next to play, it will bring up 
stuff from an old session. Uh, it brings up this programming. It may ask you, do you want to use code blocks or something else? But we always use code blocks. That's our programming language here. And it programs just like reading a sentence. So in a lot of ways, it is like dissecting a language. Uh, so when play is clicked, so when we click that play button, it's going to do these things in this order. So let's, uh, and I like the search bar. So I'm just going to stretch this out so we can see it a little better. And I'm going to choose the very first one for transform, and it's going to be moving this character. If I drag this in, now my sentence reads, when play is clicked, we're going to move Parade Girl. How far is she going to go? What direction is she going to go in? And how long does it take her to get there? So we're going to say she's going to go 10 meters. And if I had multiple characters in here that were on code, I would, could select them from this dropdown. But right now, I just have the one because I've only activated co-spaces or co-blocks for that one character. We got 10, we're going to move, when, I, when play is clicked, we're going to move Parade Girl 10 meters forward, and it's going to take one second to do it. I'm going to change that to five seconds. And then we're going to click play and see how this looks and then make adjustments to it. Not bad. She's moving at a pretty good rate. Uh, then she just stops because she went that 10 meters and then stopped. So I'm going to come back in. It's going to make this 50 meters. And if I don't change those seconds, she's cruising. So now we need to come back and make some adjustments. So let's say it'll take 15 seconds. And if you've never programmed before, you are a programmer now because this is the logic of programming, whether you and your students realize it or not. So now I click play. And when I click play, this action is taking place and moving on down the line. So uh, how's everyone doing? <laughs> it's chatting quite a bit. Is everybody okay? Everybody up to speed? Question, it seems like when we're creating, editing our own private environments, is there a possibility to have students co-create in the same environment? Yes, there is. Um, and I'll show you that real quick while a couple of us are still playing in our parade. So when I created this class for you, here's my class name, uh, and then it gives me that class code, which I put in my presentation for you to use, or I could add students. So now that you've joined my class, I can add you to additional ones. But when I create this assignment, I've got options. So my type of scene, it can be the 3D environment, uh, or you can let students decide which of these to use. We're using the 3D environment right now, but you could bring in a 360 degree image that you take, or you can be doing things on a merge cube, which is a foam cube. Uh, it's really more for augmented reality. Let's not get caught in the weeds on that. Uh, but then we put in a title and instructions. And now what I did for our class was that we had individual students. So this made that course for every single one of you when you signed up, but I could have done it in group of students. And I could have two, three, five, ten 10 students all working in the same co-space and all doing it in real time. So they'll need to establish a couple of norms so they're not stepping on top of each other. It's almost like a Google document. Uh, yeah, you can all collaborate into it, but if you're super messy, it gets messy. But if you decide, all right, I'm going to work on this side of the co-space, you work on that side of the co-space, you work on that side of the co-space, people can be creating things together in real time because you'll see what your other people in your group are doing also over to the side while you're concentrating on your piece. But a little complex for first time in co-spaces, so I didn't do that today. Oops, so back in my co-spaces, I'm back in my parade. How's everybody doing? Great, um, so let me bring in my other character. Uh, we're gonna bring in Bring in Santa Claus. Make Santa Claus large. I'm going to give Santa Claus different material so I can change his coat. It's purple Santa Claus. I'm going to go into animation and I just get a handful that come with Santa Claus. Ho 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 is pretty good. But I'm going to have him ho ho hoing down the parade route. So and I'm going to do something a little bit different. I bring Santa Claus back here, double clicking to turn on the code so that it can be used in code blocks. And now when I use code again, my code's still here. So when play is clicked, we're moving that girl 50 meters forward. But now this drop down works because now I have another character activated for programming. 
So let's move uh, another one. So I'm going to bring this block in, change that to Santa. And we're going to have Santa move backwards 50 meters over 15 seconds. And before I hit play, I'm going to move this Santa Claus to the other side of the scene. So if we're reading this as a programming logic, as a language, it says when play is clicked, we're going to move parallel girl 50 meters forward in 50 seconds. Santa's going to move 50 meters backwards in 50 seconds. And then we hit play just to test out our code. So there's our girl. Santa's not moving. Anybody have any ideas why Santa's not moving? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Well, here's why. It was following the programming language of this. So the, the sort of the rules of this language of programming are, it does one thing at a time. So when play is clicked, it's moving this girl. And this doesn't happen with Santa until this is complete. So if we watch this again, and it'll take 15 seconds because she's <laughs> going all the way down the parade route. And I probably want to change her to walking or jogging so that she's not sort of moonwalking across the ground. And when she reaches there, now Santa kicks back and moves. So let's make an adjustment to that to clean that up. And it's really quite clever. Um, inside of the code blocks language, we're looking for one called run parallel. And when I drag this in, this allows different commands to happen at the same time. So I'm gonna put girl in there and Santa in there. And now my programming language is reading that when play is clicked, run parallel, everything that is in run parallel. So these two things will happen at the same time. And they sure do. So another thing that we can do, so instead of having these characters just move in straight lines, so I'm gonna double click and change that animation because that's bothering me. We're gonna have her dancing down the street. That looks a little more realistic. All right, I'm going to come back. I'm going to get rid of that code for Santa. I'm going to do something a little bit different with Santa Claus. I'm move him back here. And let's say I want Santa to do, uh, instead of just this straight line down, Santa's going to walk a path. So we're going to have Santa do a figure eight. So what I can do is that I can hop back into my library. And we've only explored the characters part of here, uh, which is quite robust. Uh, but there's also animals that we're going to deal with. There's housing so we can bring in objects. Uh, there's nature so we can bring in trees, cars and vehicles. And these are water vehicles, air vehicles, all kinds of kitchen items. Uh, I kind of wish they uh, put less weapons in here for, <laughs> for the kids, uh, but it's, it's all fun. Uh, coming into our buildings, we get primitive building blocks. So we can put in text labels, we can put in primitive shapes. But under special, Oh, and under special, you can add another camera because we've got our default camera here that shows when we play. But let's say we want, we're going to bring in this path is what this is called. So I'm going to drag this on. I'm going to scale it up. I'm just going to click on library again to toggle it down so it's out of the way. So now we've got this path on here. And what I can do is if I double click this path and turn this on, it is used in code blocks by default. If I jump back into my code, I'm going to move and get rid of, well, we'll leave that in there because we're going to run this parallel. If I'm going to type in the word path and I get a different transition. I'm going to drag this in so that we can read it. And this reads that when play is clicked, we're going to move Santa along what kind of path? Well, the round path is the only one that we've got. It's, it's, it's called round path. We'll call this parade path. And it auto updates in my code. And it's going to take five seconds to do so. So I'm going to put this about right here. I'm going to put Santa on the path. I'm going to click. And there is Santa cruising around that path. Uh, we can make it a little more complex by clicking the path and grabbing the little blue dots. And we can. Uh, create a figure eight out of this and now set Santa on it. And he's moving much quick, much quicker because he's got a longer path to go on, but he's only got five seconds to do it because that's how we programmed it. 
And we are running close to out of time. So what parts do I want to show you still very, very quickly? We'll do a couple of speedy things. So I'm going to hop into animals. I'm going to find an animal in here for my character to ride. I always like the unicorn. So we bring our unicorn in. I, that was weird. There's our unicorn. Scale that unicorn up. And I'm going to go back into my code. And instead of uh, the girl moving 50 meters in 15 seconds, we're going to make that unicorn. So I'm going to select my drop down, and my unicorn doesn't exist. It's not in my code because I need to double click my character and turn on code blocks. And now I can make that unicorn. And now she will stand still, but my unicorn will move down. So let's give this unicorn a little bit of an action. It's going to be running down the parade route. And we don't want to forget about this girl. So we're going to double click and find an animation. We're going to do a posture. And there's one called Ride Horse. There's a variety of them. And if we click it, she is in riding horse posture. So one more time, if I double click her, another option I can deal with is Attach. And when I click Attach, these little blue dots appear all over my scene. And if I click the back of that unicorn, She's riding it and she's going to be attached to it. So now we click play and she's cruising down the parade route riding the unicorn. Uh, other things that we could have done. Uh, so inside of the code where we're having these uh, characters do their separate things, uh, we could put in, hmm, what's it called? Uh, we could put in code so they would say things. And if we got rid of the run parallel, let me do it real, real quick. Because I do want to show you how you can create dialogue inside of here. So I'm going to let me clean this up. I'm just going to get rid of a couple of things. I just want a blank slate to be able to show you. So in my uh, library, I'm going to grab a character, bring it in, make him large. Let's bring in another character, astronaut, make him large. Rotate them around and get rid of this code over here. And now I've got a casual boy. We're going to turn code on and astronaut woman. We're going to turn code on and in our programming. So when play is clicked, casual boy is going to say hi. Uh, then we're going to after that. Actually, we'll have him say hi for two seconds. Change that to three. And then we'll do it again. We'll change that to astronaut. Change what she says to hello. And that'll take two seconds. And just like that, if we hit play, boy saying hi for two seconds and then hello. And we can create a dialogue back and forth. So a lot of times I'll have my students do like a knock knock joke. It'll be knock knock for two seconds, who's there for two seconds, and then telling that joke. And that doesn't have to be in English. And that can be in any language that you want to demonstrate uh, the command of language to be able to have a conversation back and forth. Uh, it also doesn't need to be this text. So I'm going to get rid of those pieces. And so we looked in the library a little bit because there's so many items and things in here. But we can also upload our own. So I uploaded the University of Colorado logo that I put in your scene for everybody. Uh, but there's also 3D models. Uh, where we can do a web search for 3D models. So if something isn't in your library, you can search for it and bring in these 3D models from the Google 3D model library. So you can bring in that cheese pizza. It's loading. And, and there it is. And then Clint, I've got a question for you. Yeah. For those dialogue pieces, I see that like the camera is kind of to the right. Mm -hmm. You can move that camera right to like any position and sort of capture any view. Absolutely. So right now that camera is right there, which is awkward, of course. Uh, I can click and drag that camera just like anything else. I can rotate that camera. And then when I hit play, so we're going to, I'm going to grab that camera and raise it up a little bit using that, that lift tool. Oops. And now we're seeing these characters. So last thing I want to show you is that if I go into upload and go into sound, I can do my own recording. So I'm going to just record this. Knock, knock. Give that a name. 
Now it's sitting here in my library. I'm going to do another one. Who's there? And now I've got these recordings in here. Well, I can go back into my code and I can put in and bring in a play sound. And I'm just going to drag that in. And it's going to say play sound, which one? Well, knock, knock. And wait until finish. That means that it won't go to the next line until that is finished, the recording going through. So I can bring in another one. Who's there? I play this. Who's there? Knock, knock. Oh. And you heard them both happen at the same time. They spoke over each other. Yeah, because wait until finish. On the first one. Yeah. We're going to make that true. And now. Knock, knock. Who's there? Now we can create a conversation back and forth with, I mean, this is two, three lines of code, uh, quite simple. Uh, and I do want to be sensitive of time. <laughs> There's a lot more that I can show you. And if you do want to uh, be in touch, I'm, I'm happy to walk you through anything that you're brainstorming or, or thinking about. Um, there's so, oh, there's just so much powerful stuff that I can include in here that I, that I haven't yet. Um, things like uh, physics to be able to create like a bowling alley or things crashing into each other. Uh, it can be, uh, it can be a bit of a rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, so here's what I was planning on showing you today. We got all the way to audio, but we didn't get into the advanced stuff uh, that allows us to create multiple scenes, to do the collisions. Uh, I do a domino project with my students where they set up all these dominoes and turn the physics on and they hit the first one and it knocks them all down. Uh, and if you're doing any 3D modeling, uh, you can bring any 3D model into CoSpace also. I mean, it's, it is powerful. Uh, this is my wrap up screen because I know we've got 50 seconds and I want to be sensitive of everybody's uh, Zoom meetings that I've got after this. Uh, <laughs> but here's how you can get a hold of me. Um, this is my personal email, but of course you can do my Anschutz email as well. But if you want to be in touch over Twitter or email, uh, there's a really interesting Twitter hashtag ARVR and EDU, which are people from all over the world that are, are tweeting projects that they're doing with augmented and virtual reality in education. Uh, it's not exclusively co-spaces, but there's a lot of people using co-spaces in it. And if you've got to go, uh, thanks for coming. I'll absolutely share the presentation with you. If you've got time to stick around and brainstorm and think a little bit, uh, that would be magical. Uh, if you could hang out and uh, turn your microphones on and just kind of think about what popped in your head. What kind of projects are you brainstorming? What do you think is possible, might not be possible? Uh, it'd be, be great to hear what this got turning in your brain gears. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Clint. That was awesome. Oh, um, it went by so fast. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> I made a scene that I really liked. Uh, now I have to tweak it for the future. So we'll have to see. But um, can we all take I a look at it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, I did want to tell people, you know, I'll share slides and ways in, to be in contact with you as well and survey for this and see what people thought. And yeah, but I always think these are fun. Yeah. And it's always, it's always fun and interesting to, to hear what people come up with on their own. That's why I like doing the parade project because everybody does something weird and unique and uh, you can usually dissect it and be like, oh, how did somebody do that? And as the teacher, I can go into any of those scenes and I can see their co-spaces code. I can see how they constructed stuff. So I can uh, almost uh, sneak in and see how did they build what they built and then share that with other students. Did you guys make stuff? I did, but my uh, scuba diver fell off my rhinoceros. So, you know, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> I tried to get them to move oh, together, no. but that's Let okay. They both move. See if, I can, <laughs> see if I can fix it and, and that can be a learning opportunity. All right. Yeah. I, I think that coding, um, I did not do that step correctly because I was <laughs> focused on playing and not paying attention, um, which doesn't always result in a great product. But I wanted to mention that this is a really fantastic tool and I could see a lot of collaborations happen at CU between languages and uh, STEM programs. We have a lot of students who are in computer science programs, engineering programs that are um, have to ha um, have computer science as part of their degrees. And <laughs> sorry, I think this is <laughs> I think this is a really cool way for us to collaborate. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's it's a lot of fun, and it also gets quite serious once you start talking about the pedagogical impacts of curriculum and and where this can all tie into things.
Um, yeah, like I was saying, I, I've done a lot of projects where I've taken an existing project uh, that was being done for years and years and years and then looked at, well, how can we do this virtually? And the space project was one of those because inside the physics of this, you can simulate gravity on different planets. So rather than my students taking over the hallway with their uh, solar system made out of styrofoam balls going everywhere, they created it with the exact orbits and then knowing the time, well, how long does it take to go around the planet? And then converting that into something so we don't have to wait a whole year for Earth to go around the sun, but to do that at a scale where then they created the entire solar system and all the planets were orbiting just using those path tools at different time intervals. Uh, and then and then being able to, all right, we're gonna simulate Mars and then change it, put a basketball up in the sky. And when that ball falls, we're gonna change the gravity to what that ball falls like as if we were really on Mars. And where that gets cool is that once you've got the CoSpaces app, you can view this in virtual or augmented reality. So if you create that ball that falls slowly like it's on Mars, you can bring that into augmented reality, look at it through your phone and see that ball falling in your classroom as if you're on another planet. All right, let's 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 fix your scuba guy. So your scuba person, look like you attached him. I wonder why he fell off. Oh, did you go in and turn physics on? Maybe, I don't know. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, that's why. So this is a simulation. So when we hit play, uh, that character does exactly what that character would do. Because you've got the physics turned on and a scuba diver would fall off a rhinoceros. So we'll turn that phys those physics off and we'll, oh. <laughs> it's awesome. I still have to reattach it to the rhino. Now we're cruising. <laughs> so you jumped ahead, you got into the advanced physics and whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, rocket ship going up. Let's take a look at your code, fantastic. Uh, but you can see, as the facilitator, I can jump into a student's co-space, make any changes in real time, and then hop back out of it. So, so really nice as a classroom management tool. It's, it's almost, uh, it's real similar to Google Classroom in a lot of ways, where you're jumping in and out of projects and assigning projects in mass that get spread out to your entire class. So if I go back into my classes, here you are, if I create another assignment, and I'm gonna leave that in there, Let's put nothing. I'll make it a 3D environment. I'll assign it to individuals. And now all of you have access to that new co-space that I created. So it pushed it to the entire classroom. So then any of you can come in here and it's a blank slate. So uh, I'll leave this open. So any of you can now go into that same classroom and instead of going into the parade, uh, now it's called FASDF because I'm lazy, uh, but you end up with this blank slate. So you start by going into your environment and setting this up. Here's our environment. Then I go into my library and maybe I bring in a couple of vehicles and I start building this out. That's all I did to create the parade template that I then pushed to all of you, my students. And Clint, from your experience, and I know you worked in mostly K through 12, um, what do you think students when they get in there? Cause you were saying you had a second grader be able to, what do you, is there a learning curve? I mean, I know for us, we were able to go in there and it's it. shocking how intuitive the students find this because I was having second graders do it on iPads. So there's an iPad app and you can, you can, you can touch and drag characters into it and, and do things. And I mean, I really would advise sort of creating some ground rules to begin with, just so you've got some norms because it really is an open sandbox and students will go nuts, uh, especially when they go into the upload feature and can bring in a 3D model of anything that they want. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who Pickle Rick is, from the cartoon Rick and Morty, uh, but my school was obsessed with Pickle Rick. So then when we start bringing in co-spaces before we set up some classroom rules of, we're gonna take this one step at a time, uh, there are thousands of Pickle Ricks all fighting each other and falling on top of each other. And we really needed to rein that in and create sort of a, all right, we've got classroom rules. We've also got virtual classroom rules and, and here they are. And we're gonna follow these, these norms that we establish. And I usually have the students uh, have a big voice in that. Like, what do, you, what do you guys think is appropriate for us to be building in co-spaces? And they'll usually tease it out themselves. I have a question, Clint. You're at Antrix, correct? Yeah. Is OIT or your equivalent of OIT sponsoring this for your university, for your campus? No. 
No, this is uh, this is my personal account that I have here. Mm -hmm. um, I work with CoSpaces pretty heavily, so they've given me a, a free pro account that I use. Is that a discussion you've had for chance? Because you know, I'm just I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, gosh, this this could be so applicable for so many courses at CU. And right, <laughs> if it, you know, I, I I question, you know, why couldn't OIT buy a a license, a campus wide license to something like this if it could be used in so many different applications? And then yeah, I, I mean, it really comes down to what are the what are the needs and goals of each unit? You know, uh, we don't really, honestly, we're not finding any use for what you can be done in co-spaces in the dental school. So we're doing other VR and augmented things. I was gonna say, show Rebecca what you showed me earlier yeah. today for one of your new, because he is using it, but he doesn't need students to create per se, like dialogues and things, but. So. Sorry, I put you on the spot. No, not at all. Glad, glad you did. Uh, just take me a second because I've got to screen share my iPad. Of course, it worked this morning and it doesn't work this afternoon. Try it one more time. Ah, it's on the wrong network. Here we go. It's coming. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> it is awesome. It'll be worth the wait. So we've been, uh, I'll talk while I get this going. Uh, so what we've been doing in the dental school is it is really difficult when students are not on campus to see and understand instruments, to see and understand dental models. Uh, so we're using a lot of augmented reality to uh, bridge that gap. And Oh, it's gonna be so annoying if this doesn't work. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here's my screen. Uh, so this is my iPad that you're looking at. Uh, and this is my Canvas course. So my, my, our students are all on Canvas. And if they go into an assignment, for example, they can click on a link. And when they click that link, they get that model up. But then we built that so that that model appears in augmented reality. So you can see my drum kit over there. And I can walk around this 3D model and get in very, very close. I can take a step back, make it the size of the room, get in really close to a cavity or part of the instrument. I mean, this is really changing how we're thinking about teaching and learning, not just when we're in this remote environment, but, but later also, because to be able to do this in an auditorium with 120 students, where they're all looking at the model the exact same way up close, while a facilitator is uh, instructing and pointing things out, uh, incredibly powerful. So this is where we're headed with uh, augmented reality at the School of Dental Medicine. And this could be any model. And what is really interesting about 3D models is that the same 3D model that works here is the same 3D model that works on an Oculus Rift. It's the same 3D model that works in co-spaces. It's the same 3D model that uh, goes to a 3D printer. So the technology behind creating the model works across all these different disciplines, which is awesome. Not co-spaces, but definitely still under the umbrella of, of simulation and what we're trying to do here. Thank you. That was really cool. I could I could see us assigning students to um, tour guide us around a city and bring us into different buildings, around different buildings. Um, that I mean, the, the possibilities or do dialogues um, in a very different way for for languages. So I can see a lot of application for this in just languages, but university-wide, it just, it seems like, wow, why not? Yeah, another interesting thing that we did was that we sort of combined language and theater at one point. So we had a theater department and we had language learners and the language learners recreated in co-spaces the stage 
and the uh, place where the audience would sit. And then they recreated almost uh, like you would sketch out the, the wireframes of a theater of, all right, you're gonna be here and then here, like all of the blocking. Uh, they recreated that in co-spaces for the theater department. And they included their own dialogue. So they were reading the script and then tying that into the code so that you could see a scene from that play happening in co-spaces and then use it for all kinds of things. So for the actors to be able to look at it, for the stage hands to be able to see it from stage left, from stage right, to be able to rotate this 3D model in any direction. You can see the entire play happen from the audience perspective, from above. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really cool collaboration of how the uh, English learners uh, were helping and building something that the theater department could use and demonstrating their understanding of, of conversational English in the meantime, which is always great when they're, when they're demonstrating their learning without demonstrate your learning, you know? <laughs> That's kind of where the magic happens. So Clint, there's a question from Hosem about having um, images beyond just what's in the CoSpaces library. So oh, for sure. Um, yeah, let me share my screen. Let's just take a second. All right. Um, so I'm in the squid. So here's a image of a squid. Save it to my desktop. Back in the code spaces, uh, instead of my library, I'm going to go to upload. I'm going to go to images, and I can search for images right in the tool. So I could even type squid here. Oops. There's a bunch of images of squid. It also supports uh, animated GIFs. But I can take this image of the squid, and I can just drag it in. And I can scale it up. I can rotate it. It's, of course, two-dimensional. Uh, but I can do the same thing with a 3D model. If I go to 3D model and I do a web search for uh, squid. That's an octopus technically, but we'll bring in the squid. Uh, oh, there it is. It's enormous. Scale it down a little bit, raise it up. Uh, and now I've got a three-dimensional object in here that is not part of CoSpaces that I just brought in from the poly, which is the Google 3D library. And if I double click, uh, I've got some things I can deal with material because these are outside 3D models. They don't always behave the same way as all the dancing and stuff that you can do. Uh, you'll notice there's no actions, uh, but it can be in here and I can take this car and I can attach it to the top of the octopus, rotate it around. Yeah, totally flexible and possible. That is limitless. Yes, it is. <laughs> Um, if we've got a couple of seconds, I'll jump into my uh, Is there a way to ensure the search items are copyright free? Yes, that is why it's nice to do it inside of CoSpaces because all of those are uh, cleared um, Creative Commons. So there's um, virtually everything that CoSpaces brings up in that search engine is already pre vetted to be uh, legal for use. Um, yeah, so here's a whole tons of co-spaces projects that I've been working on over the years. Uh, this was, so there, here's a solar system happening. So these planets are rotating around the sun. That sun could also be just rotating in space on its own orbit. Um, what other interesting things do I have? Uh, we did earthquake simulations. Uh, this was awesome. Uh, third grade, they were doing earthquake simulations. And prior to CoSpaces, they were just setting up Legos on a table and shaking it. But if you wanted to build a smarter, better door frame, you need that earthquake to be exactly the same every single time for every student. So this allows us to not only create that simulation, but then this code is moving that floor just a little bit in every direction. But every time we play this, you're getting the exact same simulation of that earthquake. So now we can zoom in and we can start looking at, all right, well, where was the weak point in that door frame? Maybe we can reinforce that, then go back, run the simulation again, and see, can we save people's lives by building a better door frame in a different part of the world? So we were in Istanbul, which is on a fault line. So we would have earthquakes often. Uh, so we examined what do door frames look like in Istanbul? What do they look like in Kathmandu, Nepal? And what do they look like in San Francisco? And that was kind of done outside of co-spaces. So while they were building their door frames, they were also doing research on why does a massively developed country 
uh, or city in San Francisco have a much better door frame than one in Kathmandu. So it ended up being started conversation started structurally, but turned into global economics uh, immediately. I mean, it's really a nice doorway into all kinds of uh, unexpected conversations. Clint, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for the presentation. It's been super fun and interesting. But um, um, I believe you said at the very beginning uh, that there is a lot of pedagogical researches that um, talk about the impact of this, of you know, this, all this virtual reality and, um, and I would like, if, if I wanted to know more, uh, could you send me in some direction to do some reading and learn more about the, um, how it impacts the pedagogy? Absolutely. I'll send some resources when I share the link to the, the Thank you. Yeah, a lot of the, what I find to be the best literature are people that were been working in doing uh, research and understanding of, of making and maker spaces. And then they start seeing tools like this and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, the, the same kind of foundational thinking I was thinking that I was building about educating with, with making and hands-on and, and understanding how things work. Uh, a lot of that applies to uh, making in something like co-spaces. But I'll definitely share that literature, but you'll definitely read parallels between creating in VR and creating in physical environments. Any other questions? I know we've gone over it. I'm super respectful um, of everyone's time, but also Quinn, thanks for staying, you know, an extra 20 minutes and chatting it up. And I think that, uh, you know, I get to meet with Clint every so often. It's really fun. This is a very approachable person. We've got him in our community now. So, <laughs> you know, I'm really grateful for that. And I'm sure you'd be open if someone had other questions going forward. Oh, please do. If you want to hang out, I can show you a couple of other projects that I've worked on also. And maybe I'll just do that until everyone has to go and they leave. Uh, <laughs> which screen am I sharing? Uh, my co-spaces. Um, yeah, so here's that uh, theater demo. So I put together like a rough idea of what this would look like and then the students built it from there. That one's not working, but we did program. I mean, these uh, curtains just get programmed just like we did a character moving down the street. So it started with the two curtains in parallel, opening up, and then the stage was there, and we could start uh, seeing the performance in there. Uh, this one's awesome. So here's um, all of the plant. Here are all planets and moons and Pluto in our solar system. And if I click on any of these, it falls at the rate that it would fall on that planet. So I can click on Earth, falls like you would expect it. I click the moon, falls much slower. Where this becomes an awesome learning opportunity is uh, have students guess, what do you think it's going to fall like on Saturn, which they know is very, very large. Uh, so we'll click on Mars, see that it goes very, very quickly. We click on the sun, of course it just crushes. But then I ask the students, uh, so how fast do you think Saturn's going to fall? And they usually say uh, very, very fast because they know that Saturn is huge. And we click and we see that it falls at a normal rate, but not incredibly fast, like a huge planet. Uh, then they do a little bit more research and understand that it's about the composition of the planet, not necessarily the physical size of it. And once they realize that the gaseous planets are mostly gas, uh, it really unlocks that thinking and understanding of, oh, that totally makes sense why um, a ball would fall different on one planet than another. And to show you how that works, here's the code. Uh, so it's a whole bunch of um, statements in here. So when play is clicked, nothing happens, but stages all these up. So that when sun is clicked, we're gonna set the gravity to 792. I believe that's feet per second. I have to look up the research because the students had to convert the g-force on each planet to its rate per second to be able to simulate the gravity. Uh, we put a little bounciness on it. So you saw when that sun hit or when any of these planets hit the ground, they kind of give it a little bounce. That was just nice. Uh, but then we did that for each planet. So the, the gravity on Mercury is 3.7 uh, feet per second, I think. We got 9.8 for Earth. Uh, so then anytime you're clicking these, it is just turning on the gravity for those and making it fall as it would. 
Pluto's going very slow, Earth's moon. So we're able to simulate gravity in here. Pretty fantastic. Uh, what else do I got? Here's that sea level simulator. So this was that 3D model that we had created and then imported into, uh, into co-spaces. So if I go to 3D models, it's, it'll take a little bit for that thumbnail to load, but that's that 3D model. And then we brought in a texture of, of water and set that code to just raise it up three meters in five seconds. And we're simulating uh, rising sea levels at our school. Uh, here was an interesting, this was the first time that I had done physics. So this truck is going to, is it? Oh, crash through those bricks and, and things happen. So that's super interesting because that's really just a matter of turning the physics on and things will collide with each other. So you can create a bowling alley. Uh, you can create that domino rally thing that I was speaking of. Uh, we did that sea level simulator. What else is interesting? This was a student who recreated a scene from the life of Pi. So you can see Pi there in his boat. Threw in some sound effects. I love that movie. In book, I read the book actually. Yeah, that's great. Oh, there's that whale. <laughs> Pretty excellent. Uh, these were just the projects that I had created. So I can also hop in and I can look at any of these courses. So I've got fourth grade courses. I've got Miss Mahoney's class. This was the earthquake project. So here, oh. Excuse me, Clint. Yeah. Do you have a project about the foreign language teaching or learning? About what? Foreign language. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can find the theater project. Oh, here's my languages. Nope, wasn't that one. Well, I'll have to dig it up and send it your way. I think we, we might have created that theater or that language pieces in somebody else's co-space, another teacher. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. These are some of those uh, VR plate prototypes I was working on. This was an interesting one. This is a, a great uh, icebreaker for students to be able to create, sort of create a scene and explain a little bit about themselves. So this could be included with voiceovers, so explaining a little bit about their family. Uh, this is the template that they would come in. So then they would replace the character with a character that looks similar to them and include their information in here. So you can uh, answer questions. So my favorite animal, and this is all just clicking in the interaction. And if it were on an iPad, you'd see it in virtual reality and you could just tap and make it show up. But well, that's kind of the thing that we didn't really get into looking at uh, creating all of this is the actual viewing of all of it. Because once you've got this in co-spaces, you can just put it on a pair of, you just hold up your smartphone with the app and you can look around and you'll see it as if you're in that 3D environment, uh, looking around and interacting with things. And I'm clicking on things to make them happen, but you would just tap on the screen and that character or that animal or whatever would do whatever you've programmed it to do. I like that about what me for languages, like having students fill that out in a foreign language, just sharing for the class. Yeah, definitely. And there's all kinds of things that we could have covered, uh, like putting that little QR code that was on the wall for the museum. You could put that on a poster that's in English. And then when you hold your phone over to it, it overlays it with a poster that was created in another language. So you could create that poster in Canva or somewhere, import it into CoSpaces, and then it's part of the augmented app. So there's a lot of things that you could be building. You don't even have to really build it in CoSpaces. CoSpaces is just your platform to make it VR AR. Sort of like that Christmas ornament. I mean, very little of that Christmas ornament was actually done in CoSpaces. It was 3D modeled somewhere else. It was printed somewhere else but it was prototyped just by bringing that 3D model in and saying, how does this work? Here's that 3D model, but there's nothing else done in co-spaces with this. There was no coding. It was 
just a, a platform for us to be able to uh, augment it.